Hello, uh, my name is Nancy McPhee. Welcome to In Conversation with Terry Fallis. I am a programming librarian at Hamilton Public Library and I'm the moderator of today's conversation. A two-time winner of the Stephen Leacock Medal for Humor, Terry Fallis, Terry Fallis is the award-winning author of seven national bestsellers, was the 2011 CBC Canada Reads winner and his work has been adapted into a television miniseries and a stage musical. Albatross, Terry's most recent publication and the book we are discussing today, broke onto the Globe and Mail bestsellers list three days after its release. Before writing what the Globe and Mail calls the tidiest romantic comedic novels you can find on earth, let alone in Canada, Terry studied engineering, worked in provincial politics, including future Prime Minister Jean Chrétien's 1984 federal liberal leadership campaign, has hosted a popular public relations po podcast, and has a full career in communications, working with corporate and government entities. Albatross was selected for Hamilton Public Library's Scouts Book Club in March of this year, as we were all looking for a warm-hearted story during a difficult time. Golf prodigy Adam doesn't really like golf. As normalcy slips away, he wonders if success and fame are worth it. I was drawn to this story because it has a strong and important message that we should work to be the people that we truly are, even if it's hard, and that we should recognize the people who were a part of that journey. Hamilton Public Library is thrilled to have Terry here today in conversation with Hamiltonian Laura Ellis. Laura is an award-winning actor, director, writer, and arts educator in the theater and film industry. She has worked with the Hamilton Film Festival, Buddies and Bad Time Theater, and Theater Aquarius, to name only a few. Laura is the co-artistic director of women's work and co-founder of the Hamilton Loft, two collectives driven to create female-centric work. She has received the Emerging Artist Award in Theater Performance, from the City of Hamilton Arts Awards and host the show Backstage Pass on Cable 14, which highlights the careers of local artists. Before calling on Laura to begin the conversation, I will take a moment to acknowledge that the City of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase, 1792, between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit New Nation, Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our role as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. So the format of today is that Terry and Laura will speak for around 40 minutes and it will be followed by a Q&A. On the right side of your screen, there is a chat please contribute your questions in the sidebar in that chat. And then at the end of the conversation, I will communicate as many of them as I can to Terry during the Q&A. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Laura, I pass you the screen. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. First, I want to congratulate Terry on Albatross, which is another national bestseller. Um, and I just want to say I read the book, have it in my hands, um, and I really enjoyed it for a lot of reasons. Um, like personally, it was really endearing and funny. It had this really great mixture for me of, of finding depth as well um, and exploring those deep themes of kind of what it means to examine our own lives and what the definition of success means to ourselves and I, it just was so uplifting exactly what what Nancy was saying in a time where it was you know sometimes you just need something that's uh, really positive and I, I really enjoyed reading it It was really hard to put down <laughs> so I got through it very quickly 
<laughs> oh, well, look, um, thank you, Laura. Thanks very much. And thanks, thanks for, uh, for having me. Very nice to be here with you. Uh, Hamilton is, uh, is one of the cities I, I've lived in during my time when I was at McMaster. So uh, I'm always delighted to be back in Hamilton, even if we're only doing that virtually today. Oh, that's awesome. Well, you and not just uh, you obviously have a great respect for the city and you obviously love Toronto as well. Your book is very Canadian as well, which I loved. Like <laughs> just it seemed like every chapter had like some kind of little Easter egg of very Canadian uh, <laughs> uh, reference, which I love. Um, so I, I have to tell you first, I love the title. Like I think it's super clever. The double entendre is amazing. Can you tell people a little bit about that? Well, it's a it's quite a funny story because someone uh, mentioned on Twitter the other day that the word albatross does not appear in the novel in the manuscript itself. Oh, it's only on the front on the front cover, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that uh, until very close to the time when the manuscript was going to press, when they were going to be printing the books, it had a different title. Uh, I wrote the novel under a completely different title, and I like to have my titles early in the process because it somehow grounds me in the story. Uh, and I wrote it under the title, If At First You Succeed, <clears throat> which is kind of a play on that old cliche, if you don't succeed, try, try again. Well, what about if you do succeed? Um, and we went through the editing process with my, my editor, I went through the copy editing process with my copy editor. Uh, we went through the page layout. Everything was done. And and my editor called me and, and she's wonderful. And she said, okay, all the heavy lifting is done. We're ready to go to press. But about the title. <laughs> and a, apparently I was the only one who thought it was a clever and witty title. Um, uh, so I said, give me a half an hour and I'll try and come up with something else because uh, we were pretty close to the wire. And I thought about it, and I honestly don't know when the word albatross occurred to me or why it occurred to me, but I've always liked uh, double meanings in my titles. For a couple of my other novels, uh, the titles uh, have more than one meaning. My, my fifth novel, Poles Apart, my feminist comic novel, pulls apart. Once you read the novel, you realize that it has two meanings. Uh, my last novel, One Brother Shy, clearly has uh, two meanings in the title. Uh, so I, I somehow came upon the word albatross. And as you know, it's, uh, it's a line from, or it's, it's a reference to the Samuel Coleridge Taylor poem, uh, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And it tells the story of this ship crossing the ocean and in the middle of the ocean, thousands of miles from, uh, from land, an albatross flew too close to the ship and a, a sailor was able to grab it and, and he killed it. And the captain was so incensed at this needless act of violence that he made the sailor wear the albatross around his neck for several days thereafter as penance for this, this violent act. And that's what gives us that, uh, you know, the albatross around my neck, that cliche, the burden I must bear. So clearly in the story, golf becomes the burden that Adam must bear, uh, even though it's probably not a, as unappealing a, a burden uh, as others might have been. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, but albatross is also uh, a out of fashion golf term that means a double eagle. It means three under par on a hole. So Laura, if you were on a par five hole and you sunk your second shot, you would have scored the elusive albatross. So that definition kind of represents Adam's prowess as a golfer. And there is the conflict, the burden he must bear, albatross around his neck, and his great skill the gift of his skill as a, as a golfer, because he did not gain that skill by hard work and practice. He was just born an empty vessel that seemed to be built for golf. So it is an interesting, I thought, uh, single word title. And I emailed, you know, 40 minutes later, I emailed my, uh, my editor and said, what about albatross? And then I gave her the two definitions. 
And she emailed me back half an hour later and she said, I've, I've run it around the whole publishing company. The novel is now called Albatross. And that's how it happened in the space of about 40 minutes, uh, a title that I had been using for uh, months and months and months was <laughs> discarded and we had a new title in, in 40 minutes and I've been getting used to it ever since, but I, I've grown really to like the title. Yeah, I, it's so funny because when I saw it, I was like, I get that. My parents play golf. I know what that means. Oh, good. <laughs> well, it is a term that, that not many, go even go some golfers don't know it because it's sort of, it's a British term that has fallen out of common usage, fallen out of favor in the golf community. You never hear it. You hear double eagle instead, mm -hmm. but I like albatross. Um, I, you just you said it's such a beautiful way of describing Adam, which I thought like you really made clear throughout the book, which is that he felt like an empty vessel, like that is so clear. So I guess uh, in your opinion, like he grapples with a lot of things in this book. In your mind overall, what, what do you think was his biggest sacrifice in the story? Well, he sacrificed himself for much of the story because he put his relationship uh, with uh, Ali on hold. He put his dreams of becoming a, a golfer, or sorry, becoming a writer, he did become a golfer, uh, of becoming a writer on hold yeah. and everything was subjugated to this goal of becoming the best golfer in the world. And this weighed very heavily on him because he really had no agency over his success as a golfer. And I intentionally created that rather strange theory uh, that the Gunnarsson theory that underpins the, the story, because I didn't want his golfing prowess to be a result of his hard work and dedication and perseverance, <laughs> because that's, you know, that's what life is usually like. Uh, I wanted him to be totally conflicted that he's got this gift that he has to do nothing to exercise uh, and he can become famous and wealthy uh, as he does. Uh, or he can become a writer uh, where he really has to work hard at it. And he's not actually a naturally gifted writer, unlike his, his girlfriend, Ali, in the book. So I created that conflict quite intentionally because I really wanted him to struggle with this question of happiness versus success. And uh, that, 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 I think, is the question that lies at the core of the novel. Well, at least that was the intention. Uh, readers may take other things out of it, but that's what I was really trying to to get us to look at that that conflict that often exists between success and happiness. Yeah, it really does, especially for artists. I think any kind of artist that is such an ongoing struggle. Um, you talked about the Gunnarsson theory, so I just want to touch on that because that I just think that is such a brilliant concept. Like I can. I basically want to ask if it's anything based on like a real theory or a concept that you've come across. And just for, for anybody watching, it's uh, it's called also called the body type analysis for predictive innate pinnacle proficiency. Um, <laughs> and so maybe you can tell people a little bit about it. But um, yeah, I'm just I'm so curious. Like, was that just in your brain? Well, I think I, I've thought about that idea for a long time growing up. Uh, uh, I have an identical twin brother, Tim, and we're very competitive uh, and in a friendly, self-supporting way. Uh, but uh, we were always playing different sports. We were very uh, sports-oriented uh, people, and, and we still are. Uh, but we were very, very skinny. Uh, I don't get accused of being skinny that often anymore. But uh, we were so skinny growing up that there was, I mean, we would never have played football. We would have been broken in half uh, in minutes, I think, in a real game. But we played hockey and I we played a lot of badminton and, and, and golf and other sports. But I remember thinking, surely there's a sport that is well suited for my body type, my dimensions. Uh, maybe it's long distance running because I'm so was so lean. The answer is no on that, by the way. It was not long distance <laughs> running. But I, I sort of had that idea. It's been floating around in my head for a long time. And it sort of makes sense to me. Uh, and I tried to describe it in the novel in a way that would at least 
make the reader overcome their disbelief and begin to consider that it might be possible that someone could have done the work on body types and measurements and and all of that, compared it with the various sports and done the analysis and should be able to look at somebody, take their dimensions and say, you know, you would you, you might want to try uh, field hockey because you'd be really good at it. Uh, so I uh, that's where it came from. Uh, and I'm I'm pleased in a way that I've had several emails from readers who have said, yes, I'd like more information about the Gunnarsson theory. I Googled it. I haven't been able to find too much on it. Could you pass on more information about it as if it's actually a real thing? And and of course it is not. It was a, a concoction of my overactive imagination. <laughs> well, you definitely convinced me because I absolutely typed in, is Gunnarsson theory a real thing? <laughs> what is it? That was the idea. <laughs> Um, so with Adam, like he's so particular, like he has such these like quirky um, interests and little life hobbies and things. So it's like fountain pens, golf, well golf I guess kind of fell into his lap in a way, um, and even cooking you talk about. He And based on the sleeve, it seems like he's so much like yourself. Is this, is he, do you find him a lot like yourself? Is this the first time you've ever um, written like a lot of yourself into a character? Uh, I think if you've read all of my novels in quick succession, uh, even though there are six different narrators across seven, seven different novels, uh, you might realize that uh, all of the narrators tend to sound alike and they often sound like me. Uh, so one of my writerly cheats is that I tend to write in my own voice. It doesn't mean that I'm the character. I, I am not the character. I don't react in the same way as the characters always would. So the novels aren't about me. They're not autobiographical, but I'm very familiar with that voice. I know the voice. And a writer's goal is always to create with as much authenticity as they possibly can. And I think it's easiest for a writer to create the, uh, that authenticity if they're writing in a voice that is very familiar to them and very close to them, or might even be their voice, which is uh, uh, what I often do. So I'm not sure there's much autobiographical, except I, I do play golf. Uh, I'm not nearly as good as Adam is. So this is an aspirational novel for me. I hope one day <laughs> I might get, get better. But it, it was so much easier to write about golf. I mean, it could have been any sport. The sport isn't what was important in the novel, but I thought golf was a, made sense because it's an individual sport and it allows Adam lots of time for reflection and contemplation. Uh, and I know a lot about golf because I've played it since I was uh, 12 years old when I took it as my option course in grade eight. Um, so I, the, the narrator may sound like me, but there's I'm not in the novel. So I, I just tend to plumb the depths of my own experiences, though, and write about things that I know about, uh, even though I'm not in the novel. Um, so I want to ask a question. I'm going to try to be very st stealthy about not being too particular <laughs> about this question for anyone watching who hasn't read it. Um, but for those who have, in this book, there's um, a big event that happens that you kind of don't really expect. Um, and uh, so he's with his mentor, Bobby, and we can see leading up to this event, he's kind of starting to unravel, kind of, you know, he's getting worse at kind of faking it through interviews and things like that. Do you think had had him and Bobby not, you know, had Bobby not exited the picture, um, do you think he would have continued on for longer? Um, you know, would he have sacrificed more time? Uh, that's a really good question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that question, but I think it's a, a thoughtful uh, question. Um, I think he probably, it wouldn't have happened as quickly. I think you're right. I think he would have carried on uh, because he was doing this in, as I, I think he began to realize in part for Bobby as well as as for himself. Uh, he was continuing to 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 be a professional golfer and to excel in that sport uh, in a way to uh, to serve Bobby's desires in a way because she was a a golfer who was on the cusp of being a professional golfer when her back gave out on her and she had to give up that dream. So Bobby is 
living her dream vicariously through uh, Adam. Uh, so I don't think his sort of departure from the golf scene uh, would have happened quite as quickly without the catalyst of that event you referred to. Uh, and I, I wasn't expecting the event either uh, when I first started thinking about the novel, but, uh, but I thought as I got into it, it just made, it made sense. It made sense. Yeah, definitely. It definitely exactly what you said almost acts it acts as a major catalyst for what happens next in the novel. And so, yeah, I was just really, really curious because there is such a, a built relationship between them, such an important relationship. Um, so there's always this sense of like uh, almost owing it to somebody, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's true. Yeah, I'm very fond of her as a character and, and I like to write uh, older women characters uh, in my novels. I think they have been somewhat neglected in our literature. Uh, so you will often find an older woman uh, either in the background or front and center in, in my novels as I continue my crusade to, uh, <laughs> to give them their rightful place in our, in our literature. That's that's awesome, I have to say. I also love, I'm a huge Bobby fan, so <laughs> I gotta say she's, she may be my favorite character as well. Um, yeah. So going back to kind of the idea of success a little bit, which is such a huge theme in this book as well, he experiences such an amount so quickly of success in golf, um, but in your opinion, what does, what would literary success look like to him? Was it is it just getting a deal with a small publisher? Like, what does that look like to him? And then on the other hand, what does literary success look like to you? Oh, well, I, I think uh, Adam and I probably have a similar view on, on literary success. And I think he was thrilled to, to find, for a publisher to take him on in the end, though it was a, a small and struggling publisher. Uh, when you write and, and commit all of this time uh, to writing, uh, believe me, a small publisher is a godsend and you would, I would love to be published by, a, uh, by any publishing house. So I think the contrast with his publishing journey and his girlfriend Allison's publishing journey was, was in a way intentional to show the different, uh, the poles of the publishing world. Uh, but I think, believe it or not, I think he was thrilled to be to be published by Prose Pump. Uh, and he, uh, I like that he stayed with them later on when the opportunity came to sign with a much bigger publisher. Uh, so to me, uh, I mean, I started out, uh, my first novel was initially self-published because I was having the same kind of uh, good fortune or not, uh, sending my manuscripts out as Adam was having sending his out. And that is the lot of many, many writers, even most writers when they start out. It's, it is an incredible journey. Uh, if you can make it to the published land any way you can, uh, it's, uh, it can be really gratifying. So uh, I, I got very lucky. I, I'm landed with McClellan and Stewart, uh, a, a bigger publisher, and I am so thrilled with that and count my blessings uh, every mm -hmm. day. But I was a self-published author first, and I, I remember what that experience was like. So uh, just to have your book in print, regardless of the size of the publisher who has published it, uh, I think most writers are, are over the moon when that happens. It's funny, I don't like maybe this is something you particularly thought of or correlated, but in a way I kind of thought of this small publishing company as like representative of Bobby in a weird way because he brings Bobby on as his caddy and he could have any opportunity in the world to take whatever caddy he probably wanted, but he sticks with her despite, you know, having to hold his own clubs and walk his, you know, walk everything <laughs> around. And it's almost like the same type of dedication. Like you see that in both worlds, right? Right. So no, I, just, I think that that's a good point. I don't even know if that was intentional, but I like that connection that that you have made. It's one of the great things of, about being a writer is that when you write the novel, it's your novel. When it's published, it becomes the reader's novel. And there are lots of connections that readers make 
that I haven't at least consciously made. Perhaps they were made subconsciously. Uh, so I always love to hear those those stories. So uh, mm. now when someone asks me, was that intentional? I will nod knowingly and wisely and say, yeah, of course I was going, I was going for that. I'm glad you <laughs> picked up that connection. Uh, but I think it's specific. a good point and, and a valid one. So. Yeah, I was gonna say, you say it's a very specific metaphor that I used. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Um, so I have to ask, as a writer, um, what's your pen of choice? What's your holy grail pen? And do you prefer, like Adam, that physical act of writing versus, you know, typing out your book? Like, what what does that look like? Good question. Well, the the pen I'm using right now is uh, is this Stipula celluloid pen. Uh, it's a lovely pen with a beautiful, large gold nib. Uh, but I, I wax and wane. I go. I have probably fifteen or sixteen fountain pens in my uh, collection. So there was no research required for any of the fountain pen esoterica that uh, you find in the book. That was just off the top of my head. Um, but strangely enough, I don't actually write my novels in longhand. Uh, some writers do. John Irving is famous for doing that. Uh, Truman Capote did that, and, and many writers do, because it slows them down, and, and they like to 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 you know the book to come more slowly. And I totally understand that. But uh, I'm on the computer pretty quickly. I do take some notes early on in the process, which I invariably take in fountain pen. Uh, that sort of really starts me off. But once I when that pen, process is done and I start formally outlining the novel, I'm on my computer. Uh, I think I'm too impatient and uh, have so many other things going on that I, I, while I love writing with a fountain pen, I like being able to write on the computer and uh, it helps me organize my thoughts when I can correct things right on the screen. Uh, and I took typing when I was in grade nine, which was probably the most valuable course I ever took in in high school. Uh, and that really helps because I'm a touch typist. So I'm going to go kind of back to the beginning, which maybe should have been my first question, but I just, you know, I just got excited and wanted to ask a bunch more. <laughs> but um, what so what inspired this book initially? Was it like a specific person or situation or an image that popped into your head? Like, how did it kind of come to be? I think it it an event it started originally because I I have met so many people uh, in my life who have fallen into a career. They finish university or high school or whatever they were they were doing, and an opportunity presents itself, and they they sort of uh, say, "Well, I'll try that for a while," and they find that they're actually pretty good at it, and they do well at it. They get promoted, they get raises, they get headhunted. And by all the standard measures of success, they are doing very well. But it wasn't something that they planned. Uh, it wasn't something that they were looking for or that even they perhaps desired. But they seemed to do well at it. And why mess with success? And they, they stay on a career path and 20 years pass. And all of a sudden, they're you know, at the upper echelon of the company or the organization. And... They're, they realize that they're really good at what they do, but when they're honest with themselves, they might also realize that they don't wake up on a Monday morning going, yes, I can hardly wait to get into the office and get started. Like they're not, they're not doing it for love. They don't love what they're doing and it's not uh, earning them the happiness that they have sought. And probably because they were confusing happiness with success, which is easy to do. Uh, success, often leads to happiness, but not always. So, and, uh, you know, I've had a, a great career in, in communications consulting business. Uh, I co-founded a company in 1995. I still work there four days a week so I can afford to be a Canadian novelist on the fifth day. Uh, <laughs> and and, and I, I really enjoy my work. In fact, I thought I loved my work until I wrote my first novel. And then I realized, oh, this is what it's like to really love what you do. Uh, so it sort of planted this, this seed. I do enjoy my job and my clients, <laughs> but uh, I love writing novels more. 
And I wanted to examine this, this success versus happiness thing. So people I've met over the years and maybe some personal experience informed this idea of examining uh, you know, that conflict that so often exists between success and happiness, particularly in a profession like writing where success doesn't necessarily mean you can afford to, uh, <laughs> to live above the poverty line. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that was an added wrinkle to it for easy for Adam because he has all the money in the world. But it, I hope it did shine a light on the struggles it is uh, it can be for a, a writer to uh, to make their way in the world. So the characters in the novel are so like I find them very specific and particular. And were they inspired by real people? Um, and a follow up question I would have is. Who, I'm just curious, who is the most difficult to write? Mm. Well, I can tell you that there was there was a person who inspired the character of Bobby Davenport um, in, in personality, but also in, in physical makeup. Uh, when uh, my brother and I went to summer camp for many, many years, uh, our father was camp doctor at the camp. So during the girls camp session, this was on an island and not coincidentally in Lake Tomogamy. Um, uh, but so all the boys would go home and, and all of the girls would come up for their three weeks of summer camp. And occasionally my brother and I would get to stay for girls camp and work in the kitchen because my dad was camp doctor. And the sort of the head of the pro of the whole camp back then was a woman named Ann Beatty and her nickname was Herc as in Hercules. Huh. And she, uh, in a way, when I described Bobby uh, in the novel, I was describing Herc, my friend Herc, uh, who was a, a lovely person. And I think, you know, I tried in a way to match the personalities, but, you know, Bobby is not exactly the same, but she's certainly inspired by by that person. I don't even know if, if Ann Beatty, Herc, knows this, but, uh, that's where she came from. Um, the Gunnarsson character, uh, I needed I needed a, a kinesiology professor, and I thought because I write novels that are funny, or at least are I hope that they're they're funny to to most readers. Uh, I I wanted to give him a couple of quirks, and the idea of, of making him a person who had no filter is that's kind of gold for a comic novelist because you can write these scenes where he is uh, you know putting his foot in it at every turn. Uh, so it was fun to write to, to write that character. I think Adam was probably the hardest character to write in a way because I really wanted him to be not an average teen. He was quite different in many ways, but uh, I wanted his his challenge to be the the centerpiece, not his personality in a way. So he was kind of difficult to, to to write, but I I came to like him uh, a great deal. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, so in your opinion, what's from the first draft to now? What has been the biggest change, whether it's, you know, a storyline or a character or a specific event that happens in the book? Like what's changed the most from draft one to now? And I would follow up with, is there anything that you had to edit from the book that you wish you could have kept? Mm, excellent, uh, excellent question. Um, well, my writing process is such that my first draft is very much like the final draft. And, I, and let me explain that a little bit. Uh, I'm an engineer by academic training. So uh, as I've said before, engineers don't build bridges without blueprints. I don't write a novel without uh, a blueprint. So I am a very anally retentive planner when it comes to, to my novels. So if it takes me 18 months to, to write a novel, I spend the first 14 months not even writing sentences. I spend the first 14 months thinking up the story, uh, imagining the characters, mapping out the plot line, uh, deciding who does what to whom when. I have a chapter map, I have backstories on all the characters that I create. Uh, I then do a bullet point chapter by chapter version of the novel, an outline of the novel. Uh, so uh, my 
bullet point chapter by chapter outline is anywhere from 70 to 90 pages long. And when that's done and I've gone through the outline over and over and uh, it all still holds together, I'm not making any real changes, then it feels like it's time that I can write the manuscript. And then I write the manuscript in kind of a, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a daze. I just, it's a sprint. I just immerse myself in the story guided by this, this outline. And I can commit all of my questionable cerebral powers to crafting sentences. No part of me is worried about what my characters are going to do next because I know what they're going to do next. I've known for months what they're going to do next. Uh, so my first draft is very much like the version that you're reading. Uh, it's my first draft is longer. Uh, we do do some editing. Uh, I do tend to come from the why use six words when 12 will do school of writing. So I like I like long uh, ornate sentences and and my editor rightly cuts back some of that that stuff. Uh, but not much has changed in the storyline at all because that's all preconceived before I actually put my fingers to the keyboard to write the manuscript itself at the end of the process. So what was the hardest scene for you to write? Uh, I think the hardest scene for me to write was that uh, the scene that we were talking about earlier, the the sort of, uh, well, that turning point scene in, in the middle of the novel. Uh, it was hard because I hadn't written many scenes like it before. And that was one of the, I try to set myself a bit of a challenge uh, before each novel. And I, I like to read thrillers now and then. And I wanted to try and, and write some aspects of a thriller into one of my comic novels. And that was the scene that, uh, that I'm referring to. So that was difficult because I'd never written it before. So it took me a while to, to balance the humor with the sort of the suspense in the moment. Uh, and uh, I had fun doing that, but it, it took me a little while. And it was a precursor to my next novel, which I've now finished, uh, but it is more of a comic thriller all, all the way through. Uh, so I, I was testing the waters in Albatross, getting ready for my next novel. <laughs> ah, I see. That's so interesting. Um, so when you are, I guess when you're developing your novel, who's inspiring you as an author? Like who's on your bookshelf? Literally, who are you? Who are you oh, reading well, inspired by? Yeah, if I were wearing pants, I could take you around the uh, bookshelves. <laughs> and I am wearing pants, but they're short. Um, uh, I'm a I'm a big fan of Robertson Davies, the great Canadian writer, and Mordecai Richler, um, some of Margaret Atwood. Uh, uh, John Irving probably has has influenced me more than any other writer. Uh, I simply fall into his novels and uh, I loved almost every one of them. And in particular, he taught me, I think of him as my mentor. Uh, he doesn't know that, but that's how I think of him because just from oh. reading his novels, I've learned so much. Uh, but in particular, it's the idea of juxtaposing humor and pathos and sometimes rubbing them right up against one another, uh, as I often will do in, in my novels. Uh, so on, in an Irving novel, you can be laughing in one paragraph and then he will punch you in the gut and there will be a, you know, a, you know, a, a lump in your throat uh, two paragraphs later. And that emotional ride from the heights of hilarity down to the depths of great sadness and tragedy. Uh, I think that's a, a great experience and a great ride for the reader. So he taught me that. So I, I've taken a lot of inspiration from John Irving. Yeah, I think that it's those dips that really keep a reader invested, right? Because you really hang on to the events their characters are going through um, yeah. and ex almost experience it with them in real time. In a right. way. Well, that, that's the idea. I mean, I think it's possible to write a novel, I may have written a couple, that are, are more on the comic side, above the line. You're kind of happy and laughing all the way through. That isn't really what life is like. Uh, mm -hmm. We can be very happy in our lives, but none of us is free from 
the tragedy that often befalls us in in uh, the human race. And I, I just like to capture that in, in novels uh, as well. So I hope it, it, on on the whole, I hope the net will be that it's a, it's a funny and entertaining and enjoyable novel that may have caused you to think about a few things. But along the road, you're going to have a couple of dips into uh, into sadness, I think. Mm -hmm. At one point, um, actually, Adam talks about <laughs> once he's written something and it's been published, he talks about going like doing the dreaded thing of going on Goodreads and reading his reviews. Um, <laughs> is that something that you do as a writer? And if you do it, how, how does that, you know, influence your process? Does it at all? Or is it something you kind of have to just put to the side? Well, uh, like Adam, I have learned a great deal. Uh, from criticism of my of my works. If I get a bad review and I have had my share of bad reviews, not just on Goodreads, but in from the critics as well. Uh, I, and maybe because I started, I came to writing later in life. I was 45 when I wrote my first novel. I'm not sure I would have been quite as measured in my response to a negative review had I been 25 with my first novel. Uh, but I'm able to, take myself out of it for a moment and read what they're saying. And I often find a kernel of truth in it, as Adam did when he was listening to the critiques of his classmates uh, in the novel. Uh, so uh, I, I, I occasionally go on Goodreads and it's just a big free for all there. So it's not always recommended, but I have learned some things on, on by going to Goodreads and uh, I go there because I'm writing the novels for readers, not for critics. And readers live on Goodreads. So I'm very happy with all the lovely reviews. And I learn something from the one and two star reviews as well, or I usually do. And uh, I just have a couple more questions before we go to a Q&A for you. Um, just this is kind of a, just a general question. Your observation what do you think might be being underrepresented in Canadian literature right now? Ah, well, uh, I think we've, there's, uh, well, in, in a way, what's underrepresented, uh, it's not just in what people are writing about, it's the writers themselves. Uh, I am probably the most common writer out there in a way, in that I'm a middle-aged white male. Uh, and it's, we certainly have had an easier time of it, I think, breaking into publishing. Uh, and because I am a white middle-aged male, uh, I uh, my stories don't uh, dip into, I mean, I would never presume to write in the voice of a woman or in the voice of a, of a person of color because I, I wouldn't feel right in doing that. Uh, I have written a feminist comic novel uh, but I, it was still narrated by a young male feminist, and I have always considered myself to be a feminist, though I'm no longer very young. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, women are underrepresented in publishing. Um, uh, writers of color are underrepresented in, in Canadian publishing. I, I think that's changing, and events that we have witnessed in the United States and in Canada uh, in recent times are helping fuel that change and accelerate that change. And that, that's a good thing uh, because the same obstacles that women and people of color and those uh, in the LGBTQ community have faced uh, in all aspects of life are certainly represented, I think, in the publishing world as well. Uh, I hope that's changing and uh, we need to continue to be vigilant and, and work for that change. Um, that's fantastic. Um, so I guess to, to wrap it all up from my end before I toss it to Nancy, I'm just going to ask, what do you hope readers will take away from this story? What do you hope the most that they take away? Well, first and foremost, I'm glad you called it a story because that's what I hope they find in between the covers of that novel is that they find a story, uh, that there's a path that they can travel down with ups and downs, some laughs and maybe a bit of tears along along the way, but that it's a story. First and foremost, I, I sort of I, I try to think of myself as a as a storyteller. 
so I hope they'll be distracted from the challenges they're facing in their own lives. I hope they'll be entertained. I hope they might think about a few things, even if it's just done subconsciously. Uh, a book need not simply be entertainment. It can also uh, help you explore some issues and think about them in your own lives. Uh, so I hope all of those things, but in the end, if they read it and have enjoyed it and they thought it was worth the time and the money they spent to buy and read the novel, I will be more than fulfilled. Fantastic. Um, so where can people find out more about you? What, uh, like your what, a website or where can they follow you? Do you have Instagram, Twitter? What do you have? Yes, I, uh, my website is terryfallis.com. Pretty easy uh, to remember. Uh, I am on, on Twitter and Facebook. I dabble in Instagram, but I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm much more a follower on Instagram than a content creator. Um, but uh, I'm delighted if, if readers will, uh, will visit me on those platforms and, and say hello. And thanks okay. for such a great job, Laura. You did a, those are really okay. thoughtful questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that's what you get when you're into the book, I think. <laughs> um, so I'm going to pass it off to Nancy, who's going to take over the Q&A for you with the audience. Excellent. Thanks so much, Laura. So we have quite a few questions. I'm going to combine a few and uh, hopefully we'll get through most of them. Uh, so Andrew asks for uh, just some general advice on, on young authors or new authors. But he also specifically asks um, how it was, how it is to switch between working four days at your day job and then to writing for the other day of the week. Is that challenging? And can you give advice on how to make that work? Let me deal with that second part of the question first. Um, I'm very lucky in that uh, the company I work for uh, are quite flexible. Uh, it helps. Uh, it helps that I was uh, that I co-founded the company, and uh, I, you know, I know all the all the people there. But I don't simply take every Thursday off to write. Um, usually, I, I use that day for for book promotion. So if I need to go to a literary festival out in Vancouver or in Saskatchewan uh, for a few days, I will take some of those days uh, and and use it for that. So I don't, you know, I may go three weeks without taking a, you know, working five days a week, and then I might have all the following week off. So I think of it as that one day a week is a bank of 52 days a year that I can use uh, in support of my writing life. Often it's it's book promotion, but sometimes it, it is writing. So the writing often becomes a, a weekend uh, endeavor uh, for me. Um, so it, it is hard to balance because having a day job is exhausting and you can come home at the end of the day and the last thing you want to do is start writing. Um, but I think at some point your desire to write, your passion for writing, it, it grows and eventually it will overcome that sense of fatigue that you feel when you come home at the end of the day and you only have a weekend or, or evenings uh, to write. Eventually uh, that will kick in. I, I sort of think of it as the twin pillars of discipline and desire. You need a lot of desire to write to overcome the obstacles that are placed in front of you and then you need the discipline when you have that, those short windows of time, that discipline needs to come into play to get your rear end in the chair and to get you writing. Uh, so it, it will happen. I, I'm not saying it's easy. It's extraordinarily difficult, um, but it can happen. Uh, so advice to, to early writers, um, write about something that is important to you, that you feel about. Do not uh, you know, put your finger in the wind and decide what is the the hot uh, subject matter, whether it's vampires or or whatever it might be, and write about that. Uh, write about something you have a deep connection to. Uh, I think that discerning readers and certainly publishers, they know when they read a manuscript whether you feel for what you're writing, whether you've your heart and your guts are are in those words. Uh, so. You know, I wrote my first novel about Canadian politics, which is probably why 
I didn't have much luck finding a publisher the first time around. Uh, but I have no regrets of doing that because I felt deeply about those issues and uh, I wanted others to think about it. And so I wrote a novel about it. Uh, if I'd written about vampires, nobody would have would have read about it. Not that I'm, you know, denigrating vampires. They they have certainly having a good run, but I'd had no connection with vampires. So I wasn't going to do that. So be true to yourself and the quality will emerge. <clears throat> I feel like what you're describing right now is basically the journey that Adam took to being the the true writer that he really is and writing about his writing his own stories. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> you're right. Anne Marie asks, uh, "You are very humble, as is Adam, and that humbleness and the willingness to listen to other others clearly improves your writing. How do you stay humble in the light of success?" Oh, well, it's easy to stay humble. Uh, having a twin brother helps. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I like self-deprecating humor and you'll find a lot of it in, in my novels. And I like it because I, I, I always think that I have so much about which to be self-deprecating that it just sort of comes naturally. Uh, I also think it's, it's sort of a, a, maybe a Canadian trait. Uh, I don't find a lot of uh, humility and uh, humbleness and self-deprecating humor in in American novels, for instance. I mean, there is some. I'm not making a blanket statement there, uh, but I think it's you know uh, I was I was raised by two very good parents uh, who promoted and preached the the benefits uh, and the virtue of being humble, uh, and I, I'm unlikely to change. <laughs> Plus, if you ever saw me on the golf course, you you know I've got lots to be lots of reasons to be humble. <clears throat> <laughs> so Maureen asks us in chapter seven, uh, a writer from the north of the border, you have a different take, a different tone, a different sense of humor. And I think this was said to Adam when he was at school. Uh, so for you, are those some of the qualities that you just described the main qualities of Canadian writers? I think it's it's among among many, but I think there is a, di a difference in in Canadian writers. Maybe it, it's the land. I think it's our society in general, our our, our civil society. Uh, I think it is a a kinder uh, place, a kinder society. And you know, I can't think of any other place that I could have been blessed to be born where I'd be happier than than in Canada. And I think you can see that in 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 our writing. Um, uh, it, again, it's not a blanket statement, but uh, I think it is true that you can tell a Canadian's sense of humor. It's it's a little bit different. Uh, in fact, I, some of my novels are, are are set in the United States, and many people have said, "I know that's set in Orlando, but it's such a Canadian feel to it." And you know, I don't think we can get away from it. it it's it's in our bones. I think. Uh, and I'm I'm very proud of that. It's it's why can lit Canadian literature is a separate area of study because I think there there is something about it that separates it from uh, American literature and British literature and every other country's literature. Uh, it comes right from the land and through to the cities. It's all there. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So. Part of the finale of the book is that Adam donates a tremendous amount of money to building new bookmobiles. Could you talk a bit about that? Did you as a child have a relationship with bookmobiles? Uh, I never have because uh, I grew up in, in Toronto, uh, but I did have a good relationship with our local library. But I've known many people whose, whose life has been greatly influenced by their access to books through bookmobiles. They were they were raised in more remote communities where they did not have uh, bricks and mortar libraries. And the bookmobile was this, you know, this lifeblood that drove through the community once a week or twice a month or whatever it might have been. Uh, so I kind of wanted to pay tribute to that uh, uh, because I, I think I think at that at the right stage in your life, access to books can change your life. 
uh, and change the course uh, of your life, as it did for Bobby Davenport in in the novel. And I kind of wanted to use her as my way of of paying homage to libraries and bookmobiles uh, across our country and around the world because they they perform you perform a tremendous service uh, for the community and for society and it ought to be uh, recognized and not subject to annual cuts the way uh, we seem to be facing in the last 20 years or so. <clears throat> Great. Well, that sounds like a, a great place to uh, to wrap up. Uh, if you weren't here for the beginning of our conversation, Terry Fallis's Albatross has, uh, is part of Scout's Book Club. It's available as an ebook, and now that HPL has takeaway service, it's also available as a physical book. Uh, so please use your online account, sign up for an account online, uh, give us a call, and we can help you get a copy of Albatross if you had not already read it. Uh, a great thank you to Terry and Laura for this conversation today. We will be saving this conversation it will go on our YouTube so you can always uh, come back and see it again another day so many many thanks Terry and Laura. Nancy thank you for having me and Laura thanks for the great job you did all the best with your acting endeavors and I uh, oh. hope we get a chance to meet in person sometime. I do too I hope I get a chance to see anybody in person at some point in time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah thank you for having me Nancy and and Terry it was so wonderful to get a chance to read your work and I look forward to I think my next one's going to be best laid plans that's that's the recommendation I'm getting. <laughs> Good thank you Good thank day. you so much and all those who are watching thanks for coming.